Welcome everyone to this patient focused webinar. My name is Adam Lara from Insight Tech and I'm pleased to be part of today's virtual educational event. Please be patient as we take just a few minutes to allow everyone to get signed on and the presentation will begin shortly. And again, welcome everyone to this patient-focused webinar. My name is Adam Laura from Insight Tech, and I'm pleased to be part of today's virtual educational event. Uh, just please take, uh, please be patient. We're going to take another minute or two to allow everyone to get signed on, and the presentation will begin shortly. All right, it looks like we've got a good number of attendees signed on, so let's go ahead and begin. The goal of today's presentation is for educational purposes. We are very fortunate to be hearing from Dr. Vanessa Milano from Hackensack Meridian Neuroscience Institute at JFK University Medical Center as she discusses focused ultrasound as a treatment option for patients diagnosed with essential tremor or tremor-dominant Parkinson's disease. Along with Dr. Milano, we also have Jacqueline Cristini, the program coordinator, who will be the point person for anyone to reach out to. As questions arise during this presentation, please utilize the Q&A button located on the bottom of your screen. We will have time after the presentation to answer the questions that are asked within the chat. So let me begin by introducing you to today's presenter, Dr. Vanessa Milano. Dr. Milano is a neurosurgeon focusing on the application of functional neurosurgery in Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, ataxia, dementia, epilepsy, mental illness, pain, and neurotrauma. She received her bachelor's degree in biological science, sciences and Russian language from the University of Notre Dame and graduated medical school summa cum laude from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She trained in neurosurgery at the University of Rochester until 2020 and subsequently completed clinical and research fellowships in stereotactic and functional neurosurgery at the University of Toronto. Her skill set includes deep brain stimulation, stereotactic lesioning, laser interstitial thermal therapy, gamma knife radiosurgery, spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve field stimulation, and high-intensity focused ultrasound. She has performed investigations in the use of focus ultrasound for the treatment of tremor and brain tumors, producing neuroplasticity and modulating the function of the brain. Welcome, Dr. Milano, and thank you for presenting this afternoon. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, everyone, for joining us here on this wonderful November or October <laughs> afternoon. We're almost there. Um, so what we'll be discussing today is focused ultrasound as a treatment for Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, specifically focusing on the tremor portion of those diseases. Now, while Insight Tech uh, has been very helpful in getting the word out about focused ultrasound and spreading the word about this amazing technology, they don't compensate me for doing this. I do this because it's something I'm passionate about and because I really have a vested interest in making sure patients are educated about what their options are. Now we heard a little bit about me already. I am from Houston, Texas originally, so please forgive me if any y'alls or twangs creep in. Um, and a common question I get is, how long have I been here at JFK? Well, I've been here for a little over a couple of years now, uh, and it's been a very exciting process 
in getting focused ultrasound established here, especially with the new Prime system, which is amazing. And um, I look forward to telling you a little bit about it in the next few minutes. So when we say lesioning, what is lesioning in neurosurgery? It's exactly what it sounds like on the tin. We are doing targeted destruction of a piece of brain tissue. In many cases, this is the size of a grain of rice that we're, we're targeting. Uh, in the realm of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, we're talking mostly about thalamotomy, sometimes about pallidotomy, and then there's you know, more experimental things that are down the road, but mostly focusing on thalamotomy. Uh, we can do these types of lesions pretty much anywhere in the brain, uh, and we do them with, with heat uh, by putting a probe into the brain and just burning the tissue directly. We can do it with radiation, uh, using radiation beams to converge, it's called gamma knife radio surgery. And then now we have the ability to do this with focusing ultrasound waves. Now it is a lesion, so once it's there, we can't really take it back. Uh, something that clearly differentiates it and distinguishes it from something else you might've heard about, which is called deep brain stimulation, where we're more modulating the brain tissue. And you can see there on the on the brain scans, there's a little bit of a, a little, little arrow there pointing you towards where there's a little lesion. And uh, in that top right corner, that is the um, older setup I've used of focused ultrasound, um, which is now uh, much, much improved. The technology has gone through several iterations of, of improvement and is now extremely facile and accessible. Now, you might have heard, you know, back in the in the early 1900s uh, about some type of lesioning um, that we used in psychosurgery for for different kinds of mental illness. Um, you know, lobo um, frontal lobotomies or leucotomies, and those were very non um, precise procedures. Now, what really got us to jump to the next level was this thing called a stereotactic frame, which is what that uh, device is that the gentleman's holding over on the left side. That's Lars Lexell, who uh, is credited with developing this Lexell frame, although you know, the Spiegel developed a frame a couple of years before him, but he really perfected it. So that was 1949. So, so this is not something that is new. It might sound like Star Trek type stuff, but we have been doing this since before the original series aired by a few decades. We are still using this frame today, uh, albeit now we have this more sleeker, sexier version of it that's painted brace car blue and is much lighter um, and it's much more comfortable for the patient as well. So we do focus ultrasound with a version of the stereotactic frame. So what is focused ultrasound itself? It is non-invasive. It has a very, very high degree of spatial resolution, which means that we can hit that grain of rice with extreme precision. Um, we can do superficial and deep brain regions and the effects vary by intensity. So when we think of focused ultrasound for making a lesion, that is high intensity. And the good metaphor for that is if you think about the the wave uh, the um, beams of light that come from the sun you can focus those with a magnifying glass and burn a little hole on the ground or in a piece of paper that's exactly what we're doing with the ultrasound waves and i'm not a physicist so that's probably a very basic overview understanding of it but that gets the general picture across now we've been using ultrasound much like you know with with stereotactic lesioning. We've been using ultrasound for many, many, many years uh, to get up to this point. And we've been using it in many different ways, you know, from, from um, diagnosis to drug delivery to um, <clears throat> uh, dissolving clots to dislodging kidney stones. And we are also able to use it now in essential tremor in Parkinson's disease to create very, very precise lesions. And you might think, you know, this technology sounds so great. It has immediate effects. 
It's non-invasive. It's incisionless brain surgery. Uh, why has it taken us this long to get here? And this is a little bit of a, a history of using focused ultrasound in the brain. So you see over there on the left side, you know, not even on the graph. It's not even on the scale here. Uh, 1962, we were using ablation uh, with focused ultrasound through a cranial window. That was the 60s. Uh, that was a very long time ago. So why is it just now that we're, we're really using this? Well, um, two different reasons. One is uh, we needed to highly develop the real-time temperature imaging in the brain. So as we do this type of lesioning, we get real-time data about how hot things are getting so that we know what we're expecting in terms of the lesion. The other reason is because the skull turns out is a tough nut to crack. Um, there are um, there have been a lot of barriers to getting this focused ultrasound through the skull, which can can vary in how dense it is. So you can see there on the right side, there's some people that have a low skull density uh, where it's a little bit more porous. Um, and there's some people that have a higher skull density where it's like really, really thick. And it's something that you get a feel for as a neurosurgeon when you're drilling through the skull. Um, but it is actually a very important variable in doing these procedures. So why does focused ultrasound work? Why does making this one tiny little lesion work for these complex types of tremor disorders like Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. Well, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor are born from problems with the communication and balance between these deep areas of the brain that are marked out on the left. Uh, and these are essentially relay stations for movement. And if there's something that's not connecting, something that's off balance or not coordinated, you drop the baton and those signals don't get through appropriately. And that leads to the different types of movement problems that, that we see in those conditions. Everything is extremely highly connected in the brain, of course. And so that's why making even a tiny, tiny little change that size of a grain of rice can be so impactful. Now, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor are separate conditions. I do have some patients that have some overlap there. They kind of have a blend of both, but they're, they're very um, different in how they're treated medically. And then of course, treated surgically um, for Parkinson's disease. When we make that little um, uh, hole in the brain, the size of a grain of rice, we can either do what's called a thalamotomy, which is putting that hole in the thalamus or a pallidotomy, which is putting it in the globus pallidus. And that's just, a couple of these structures that are that are highlighted in color on the left side there. Uh, and it was approved for Parkinson's disease in 2018. Now for essential tremor, it was improved to do only on one side in 2016. So about uh, eight years ago. And then it was approved to be done on the second side in 2022. And so what typically happens is a patient will have one side of their brain treated, and then we let that side of the brain recover. We see what the effects are like. And then eight to nine months later, we decide if we need to do the second side. And the reason for that being more of a consideration in essential tremor is because Unlike Parkinson's disease, patients with essential tremor typically will have it on both sides of their body. Now, one side will probably be a little bit worse or that's where it started, but it's a bit different from Parkinson's disease in that with Parkinson's disease, I very commonly I'll see patients that have horrible tremor on one side of the body and virtually none on the other. So what is the procedure for, for getting this done? So first you see me, you see Jackie. Um, we tell you all about it in person, go over any questions you might have. Uh, we'll make sure that there's not any issues that we'll run into medically. Um, 
We'll also have your medical doctor check you over just to make sure, especially things like blood pressure. That's something that's that I keep a uh, really close track of during the procedure. Um, I do have patients briefly stop their blood thinners before this. And then we get you a CAT scan to check that density of your skull. And um, if nothing else, you can at least tell your spouse if your skull is too dense or not dense enough. And that could be a topic of further discussion uh, over, over dinner for that day. Um, when you come into the hospital, first you'll come in through uh, our interventional radiology suite. Um, one of the nurses will put an IV in, you'll get some medication. Um, you know, nothing, nothing too crazy with Tylenol, a little bit of steroid, uh, and some medication to uh, help with any nausea that you might have. Then you'll co come over to us in the MRI area. And the one thing about this procedure is that we do have to shave your head bald. Um, you can keep your eyebrows and your beard and that's a comfort to a lot of people, but we do have to make sure everything is nice and shiny like a uh, baby's bottom bald up there because uh, any hair that gets trapped along the hair follicles can interfere with the procedure. Once the head is all taken care of, then we'll put that stereotactic frame on. So that screws into the skull in four points, two in the front, two in the back. Now it doesn't go all the way in. Um, it's something that the those little sharp pins will just anchor directly onto the outside of the skull. And you'll get numbing medication in those spots so you don't feel any sharp pains. Now pressure is normal and to be expected, but it will go away. Once the frame is on, then we'll move over into the MRI suite and onto the MRI table. The head will be placed in this kind of helmet-like structure, which will then fill up with water. So once you're in there, you know, it's gonna be difficult to move. You definitely can't move your head, but you can move your arms and your legs a little bit. You can wiggle a little bit and I'll be able to see and hear you the whole time when I'm not in the room and doing planning on the station, which is the next thing that happens. So the next thing that happens is we'll do an MRI scan. It'll be a very detailed MRI scan so that I can target appropriately, put that lesion where we need it. And then we'll do some testing. So we'll do a little bit of a, a gentle uh, lesion, if you will. We're not quite hitting the, the turn it up to 11 yet, but we're, we're just inching up there and we're looking to see how the heat behaves in your brain. Once we're happy with how that looks, then we'll do the, the treatment sonications is what they're called. Now, it can get very, very hot when we do the sonications. It, a lot of it depends on how dense your skull is, um, how high the settings are. And you'll get a warning every time this is what's going to happen. You might feel um, things, things heating up. You might feel some burning. And you'll also have a button to tap out if you really, really need to. But most patients really don't take that option. After the sonication, then we'll come in and we'll test you with those spirals that you've probably seen a million times at this point. And That'll tell us you know, how well we're doing in terms of controlling the tremor. And it'll also tell us what parts of your tremor need a little bit more touching up. So is it more of your fingers that need some touching up? Is it your wrist? Is it your shoulder, your elbow? And then we can adjust accordingly and do more sonications after that. And then kind of we rinse and repeat there a bit until we're happy and satisfied with, with how the, the spirals and your writing looks. And then uh, you'll come off the MRI table, we'll take that frame off, and then we'll have you go over for observation for a little bit until you're ready to go home. And it's usually about an hour that, that patients will stay with us and get some juice and crackers and whatnot. So all in all, the whole process, so the, the pre-procedure process, probably about an hour there, and then it's about an hour on the table. And that's a huge improvement from, from my experiences with the older versions of this technology. Um, it used to be that patients would be on the table for much longer. Now it's less than an hour on the table. 
and then about an hour before going home. So you come in in the morning, home before lunch. So this is a, a mock-up of how things will work. I can see you inside the MRI scanner. Um, I have a little planning station where I'm doing all different sorts of measurements and controlling the, the energy delivered and delivering the sonications. And uh, of course, if you say something, I can hear you and you'll have that button to, uh, to stop any of the procedure if you're, you're really, really uncomfortable and can't continue. And this is an example of one of those spirals, if you haven't seen one. Um, so we have you do this in the MRI scanner, um, which, as you can imagine, is a little bit difficult when you're laying down. But we'll do one with you at the beginning uh, just to get a baseline. And once we're done with the procedure, then you get something that's similar to the bottom image there. So that being said, what are the results? So Number one is this is an immediate treatment effect. So this is different than the other type of lesioning I mentioned earlier called gamma knife. So gamma knife radiation will produce a lesion, but it will take on average about five months to really see the effects. This one, you come in with a tremor and then you go home with minimal tremor. And why do I say minimal? Because the goal is not to completely eliminate the tremor. Everyone has a tremor. If you, if you, even um, a lot of surgeons will have a tremor, and you don't see it necessarily unless they're super sleep deprived and on their eighth cup of coffee, which you know is not that infrequent now that I think about it. But um, there's usually certain conditions that that tremor in even someone without Parkinson's disease or central tremor will come out, and you will see it. So we're not making you better than the the typical patient that doesn't have Parkinson's disease or central tremor. What we want to do is we want to get to a point where the tremor reduction is meaningful for you. And that's really looking at things like, can you drink out of an open cup? Can you write your name? Can you sign your name? Um, can you put clothing on with buttons or zippers or ties? Uh, do you feel embarrassed to go out to eat because you never know what it, what your tremor is going to be like. And so in terms of meaningful results for essential tremor, we see a, about a 74% meaningful tremor reduction after five years. You know, keep in mind that uh, we had FDA approval for essential tremor, tremor in 2016. So we don't have huge uh, populations of data for 15 years of observation. But we do have it for five years. And at five years, our, our improvement is pretty durable. Um, Parkinson's disease, a little bit less, but still about a little over 60% meaningful tremor direct reduction at three years. And also keep in mind that the Parkinson's disease approval was a little bit lagged behind the essential tremor. So that's why we only have three years there. Uh, up front, um, the tremor reduction I typically expect is about 85 to 90%. So it can be quite dramatic at first, and then over time, it can it can uh, level out a little bit to where you have, still have a little bit of tremor, but it's still a meaningful tremor reduction. So that being, you know, now that we've discussed the good things about um, high intensity focus ultrasound, what are the risks? So I've separated these out into categories just to minimize confusion. So there are the things that are frame related. So a pin site infection, you know, where those little pins anchor into the outer part of the skull. It's possible to get a little infection there, but we really do not see that frequently. It's one in thousands um, in occurrence. And if it happens, then we just do a little bit of antibiotic. Uh, then there are the procedure related things. Um, so it's typically something like a headache or dizziness, and it's usually very self-limited. Um, most patients, it'll get better in the first 24 to 48 hours and will be completely gone by one week. It's not something that tends to stick around unless there's something else going on. And then there's the lesion-related side effects. So the big one that you'll hear about the most frequently is a problem with balance. That's why we test people 
very carefully before the procedure to see if there are any effects on balance already. And if you do have a balance problem, I might recommend a different kind of treatment for you or have a very straightforward conversation with you that this is a side effect that we see your balance can get worse and that we're all aware of, of those issues that might come up after high food thalamotomy. Um, balance problems typically tend to occur in about one in five people to a meaningful degree. Um, in most patients, they do go away. So you'll typically notice them at their strongest in the first week after the procedure, first eight days. And then by about three weeks, you might see it tend to get better and then it should be resolved at three months. If it's not resolved at three months, it's probably gonna stick around, but that's a very small uh, percentage of people where it sticks around that long. The next thing that we see more frequently is sensory changes. That's something like a little bit of numbness or tingling in the corner of the lip or in the fingers or hand on the side that we treat. And that also tends to go away, just much like the balance problems. Then the things that I see less frequently are things like altered taste, uh, or if you, you have read any of the medical literature, dyskousia is what it's called. Um, I had a couple patients like this. One said they had more of a metallic taste in their mouth, and another said that he couldn't taste spiciness as much, so he needed to put more spicy stuff in his food to really get that that spice satisfaction that he was looking for. And then the last one that uh, we're very careful about during the procedure, so therefore we don't see it as frequently, is stiffness and weakness. Now, why is that? Well, right next to the thalamus where we're doing the procedure is a highway for your movement. And we stay a certain distance away from that highway. We have no problems with your movement. If we get too close to that highway, you can get weak. Now, fortunately, with the advanced imaging that is incorporated into the new prime system, that's something that we can see very, very clearly now uh, in comparison to prior versions of the device. And it would be very unusual to, to have this kind of side effect in those cases. So why wouldn't you do HIFU? I mean, it sounds great. Um, incisionless brain surgery, home the same day, immediate effects. So uh, these are some of the reasons why we wouldn't do HIFU. So if a patient with Parkinson's disease uh, has severe dyskinesia, this is those involuntary bigger movements um, that can fluctuate throughout the course of the day and day to day. And in those cases, it's really, it can be a matter of safety inside the scanner. Um, having had deep brain stimulation before. So it's okay if the leads were in, but were taken out. But if the leads are still in because they are for an object uh, and they are not similar to brain in the way that it reacts to ultrasound, it can both interfere with the heating, and it can also heat up itself and cause injury in that way. So that's something that we do not want to happen. Uh, history of brain bleeding is another uh, flag that pops up that signals that it might not be the best choice because there could be a like more, it could be more likely that you could have some bleeding during this procedure. Um, presence of a type of vascular malformation called an AVM or aneurysm, a little blister on the side of the blood vessel um, for similar reasons. Blood thinning, all three of those are pretty much in the same category. Um, and then we get to some someone with severe memory problems or to the point where they can't follow directions. So understanding what's happening to you because there's a lot of weird sensations and um it's an unfamiliar environment is it's really important to be able to communicate 
uh, with our team. And the last thing I want is someone to go into the device and try to grit through the procedure, not understanding what's happening. I can't imagine what that would be like. And it's something that I'm I'm not willing to uh, put people through. Um, patients that are unable to go and under MRI, obviously the whole um, treatment part of the procedure is done in the MRI scanner. Um, if someone has a pacemaker, it depends on, is that pacemaker MRI compatible? Same thing with any other kinds of devices. Um, and also in that category would be people that are extremely claustrophobic. If you require sedation to go into the MRI scanner, this is probably not a good choice for you. Alternatively, I have heard stories of people kind of desensitizing themselves to the, the claustrophobia over time by kind of setting up a little tunnel in their house that they go into every day to get used to it. And so that way they're not terrified um, and need to be sedated. Um, and you know, the importance of that is, is twofold. So one, like we said before, we do need to be able to communicate with you in a, in a quick and efficient way. And number two, many types of sedation will result in suppressing your tremor. And we do need to see the tremor to make sure that we are treating appropriately. And then the last one here is skulls not thick enough. Um, so that's that skull density ratio that we talked about a little bit before. Um, now, having done these outside of the United States, I have done many patients with a, the lesser dense skulls or the less efficient skulls. Um, and it can be done, but it can be extremely um, uncomfortable. And there is a regulated limit on it currently, although that might change in the future as we as we see more um, data for these in these low SDR categories. And of course, you know, individual risk benefit analysis. You know, if uh, like I mentioned before, you are someone with a central tremor and you also have a really, really, really wobbly gait. The last thing I want to do is treat your tremor and then you end up in a wheelchair because you can't walk well. So that's what I mean by risk benefit analysis. Uh, and the key to that is again, open, clear communication. And sometimes life throws you a curveball and the universe decides for you. This is a gentleman that we had come in for focused ultrasound and his head was a little bit too big for the stereotactic frame. So he had to go on to have another different kind of lesioning treatment. Um, but maybe one day we won't need frames altogether, but for now uh, we do. So uh, thank you for um, joining us today to conclude. High intensity focused ultrasound is a non-invasive way to make big changes in the brain, but uh, don't get me wrong, it is a neurosurgical procedure. Uh, it is safe and effective for control of tremor in certain patients with Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. While there are risks associated with any type of surgery or procedure that I do, the risks are overall low with high intensity focused ultrasound and not every procedure or surgery is right for every patient. So it's important to have an open discussion about the treatment with your doctors, family, and other patients that have experienced high intensity frequency a high intensity focused ultrasound or deep brain stimulation. So once again, thank you. Uh, the, these are the members of our team. So myself, Jacqueline Christini, our program coordinator and our three neurologists, Dr. Hanna, Peruli and Svetlanov. And you can reach us uh, at the Neuroscience Institute at JFK Medical Center uh, with this phone number below or email Jackie, or you can go straight to our website uh, where you can put your information into form or even uh, in Cytex website. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Milano, for, for that presentation. That was that was really wonderful. Um, we'd like to begin now a little bit of a Q&A session. Uh, so for those of you who are, who are out there and, and on watching this presentation, 
As a reminder, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So whether you're on a phone, a laptop, a tablet, um, you should have a Q&A button. You can go ahead and type in a question uh, for Dr. Milano, and I'll go ahead and read them out loud. There were a few that did pop up, so I will begin with those and, and perhaps give, give some other people another minute or two to type in their question. So first question, Dr. Milano, it says, I take medications and they help with my tremor a bit, but I don't feel great while on them. Can I have this treatment? So without knowing anything else, um, yes. Uh, the medication, uh, the medications, so all right. um, one third of patients that have a central tremor and go on medications will not have a satisfactory effect from them. Um, even more of them will have side effects that limit the ability to use those medications to their fullest. So in both Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, that is one of the criteria that we use. Uh, number one being, you know, is, has medication been effective? Okay, so maybe it was effective for a little while, but then it became less effective over time. You tried a different medication, same thing happened, and now we're, we're stuck. The other thing that we look at is did the medication work, but with significant side effects? So, you know, propranolol, uh, which is one common medication, can lead to low blood pressure, low heart rate, dizziness. Um, gabapentin can lead to a lot of brain fog, sedation, um, primadone, which is another medication for tremor, can lead to a lot of dizziness or, or, or wobbly gait walking. So if someone has, you know, a little bit of effect on their tremor from their medication, but their side effects are, are limiting them, then that would be a good time to start thinking about focus ultrasound. Wonderful. Thank you for that answer. Next one says, how extensive is the follow-up for this treatment? So follow-up uh, is three months in duration. So I typically will see patients uh, after two weeks and then I'll see them at one month and then I'll see them at three months. Now, remember we did mention that focus ultrasound can be done on both sides of, of the brain. And we do that in a staged manner because our, our early, early, early evidence, when people tried to do both sides in one sitting, it it produced more side effects than, than expected. So that's why we wait so long. Um, so if I follow someone up to three months, you know, what happens at that eight or nine months when they're thinking about maybe doing the second side? Well, most patients that were happy with the treatment and want to get the second side done will, will just, uh, let me know. <laughs> so I don't need to see you all throughout those eight to nine months. Up to three months is is a good time period because that's when we we expect to see any of those side effects to be gone, and then we can point you in the right direction as far as if there's side effects, what are the things that we do next? Great. Next question says, if I recently had a hip replaced, can I still get this treatment? So I would certainly wait until 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 you're recovered from your hip replacement. As you might know, MRI beds are not the most comfortable places. We do everything we can to get you comfortable with a wedge under your knees and padding and blankets and everything. Uh, but it's still not a comfortable place to be, especially if you've had hip surgery. Um, most uh, implants that are used in orthopedic surgery are MRI compatible or conditional. So that is definitely something that we're able to accommodate. Perfect. Uh, there is another question here that just popped up. Says, so generally, how does the procedure last? So, I mentioned uh, in the pre-procedure phase, it's usually about an hour. So that's you're coming in the IV, um, shaving the head and putting the frame on, and then when we get into the MRI scanner, <clears throat> it's about an hour on the table. The sonications themselves, you know, it's it's a little bit operator dependent, but they range from you know about 12 to 20 seconds for the actual you know pushing the button and you know making that grain of rice area heat up really really hot 
Um, and so that table time is usually about an hour. Sometimes it can be less. Sometimes it can be more just depending on what we're trying to achieve. And then once you're out of the MRI scanner and the frame is off, then you get to go home after about an hour. Perfect. Um, another question did just popped up. It says, uh, please remind me of the side effects. Thank you. Sure, sure. So side effects, the <clears throat> one of the more common ones is something called ataxia or a wobbly gait. That's why we always have people do the heel to toe testing uh, in the clinic to see how wobbly their gait is. Um, always ask people if they've had any falls. We're working on getting something called a magic carpet where we can actually do a, a an objective assessment of your gait where you where you walk on this runway and it'll measure the pressure of your feet in different areas and how fast you're going and all these different parameters. Uh, so problems with with walking, usually about one in five to one in four. It depends on um, you know, center, depends on targeting. Um, it depends on the patient. Did they have any problems with walking to begin with? And then typically that will improve, but there is a small percentage of people that will have persistent problems with walking um, at the three month mark. And that's when we expect, you know, this is probably going to be more permanent than temporary. Um, things that are um, still on our radar, but we we get a little bit you know more lenient with is something like a numbness or tingling sensation uh, in the fingertips or corner of the mouth when on the side of the of the body that's treated. And typically that will also resolve on its own. And then there's the more uncommon things like um, some altered taste sensation um, and then um, stiffness or weakness on one side of the body. Perfect. And there was just a follow-up question to this is when it comes to these side effects, when am I certain I'm in the clear? Meaning if I'm free of side effects at one month, does a chance of developing side effects lessen or three months like you just stated? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the typical window for expecting to see something is in the, in the seven to 10 day window. So if we don't see anything in those first seven to 10 days, it's unlikely that we're going to see something new develop over time. Now that's different uh, in comparison to something like gamma knife radiation, where the effects of the treatment and the side effects themselves are delayed. So we don't see sometimes until weeks to months later, um, those side effects and the effect of the treatment. But for focused ultrasound, it is an immediate effect. So we typically see those side effects within the first seven days. And the reason why there's a little bit of you know, why it's not, you know, 100% immediate is because anytime we do any kind of heating up or, or lesioning in the brain, there's always a little bit of swelling that happens afterwards. So swelling in the brain it typically reaches its maximum at around the three to five day mark, which is why I say, you know, if we, we don't see those side effects within the first seven to 10 days, we're probably not going to see them. Right. Right. Good explanation. Thank you. Um, another question says, where can I find a clinic that performs this procedure? <laughs> well, uh, we have one here at JFK University Medical Center, and I believe that Insight Tech has a list of all of the different um, sites that have this technology uh, on their website. Perfect, perfect. So there currently are no open questions um, in the Q&A chat. Uh, so Dr. Milano, obviously, you just really want to thank you for taking your time uh, doing this very, very well presentation. Um, we've got we've had your contact information and, and site information up here throughout this Q&A uh, portion. So uh, before we end here, I'd just like to pass it over to you if you have any final thoughts or words uh, for the audience. Uh, no, again, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that this was educational. I hope that you got a lot of information out of it today. I know that it's, you know, like um, uh, drinking through a fire hose at times when you get all this information, but I'm always happy to meet with people. Jackie's always help, happy to meet with people and you know, help answer any questions or clarify any details. Um, because again, our goal is to make sure that you're educated and empowered to make choices affecting your life.
And if I might add, uh, Dr. Milano, uh, my number is there. If anyone does have any questions um, that uh, you can't think of right now, please feel feel free to uh, to reach out and give me a call. I'd be more than happy to talk with you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jackie, as well. And thank you, Dr. Milano, on behalf of of Inside Tech and the Neuroscience Institute at JFK University Medical Center. We'd like to thank you all for taking your time here with us today and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your day and evening. Take care.